for those of you who don't know me, uh, looking across the room, there's actually a good number of faces that I don't recognize, which is great. Uh, always nice to see the, the old faces as well. Uh, but I'm Brian Bachman, I'm at the uh, Mortgage Institute for Research. There we go. And I have a good clicker that works now. Uh, and I want to give a little update about the production services activities at, uh, uh, along the OSG fabric and services. And, and actually, uh, I, I'm going to have overwhelming lots of technical details because I'm a technical person. Uh, but in case you forget all the details, uh, I, I want to leave you at least with this slide. What do we even mean by, by production services? What, 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 how do we think about this? And, and I'd actually go up one level and say that one of the things, the most important thing maybe that the OSG consortium does is help run uh, and organize the, the OSG fabric of services. Uh, so when we talk about services, we actually take a pretty broad view of this. So uh, don't just limit it to some HTTP server listening on the internet somewhere. Uh, that might be where we think about production services. But I want to point out there's a lot of other things that the, the OSG consortium does. Uh, so, so Brian Lynn uh, leads the OSG software team and they run, uh, provide software services. They provide a nice tested integrated step and I think that's a great service to the community. Uh, Christina Cook uh, leads the facilitation team and I don't know if Pascal made it in here who leads the collaboration services team and they provide what I think of as consulting services, kind of intellectual, working with researchers, working with collaboration, help making their science go forward. And that's also uh, a really important thing that uh, a part of the OSG fabric of services. And then yes, there's uh, piddly little us that are far less important than the research facilitation or the uh, uh, working directly and, and pushing science that, yeah, we do provide uh, networking services uh, or, or network services. You know, these, we do run the HTTP servers that provide data. Uh, we run CEs, we run uh, the, the OSDF. Uh, and, and in fact, the services and the fabric of services really are built into who we are. If you take a little bit from the, the OSG homepage, you'll see that uh, services popped up a couple of times in terms of what, how we think about ourselves. Uh, you know, in terms of running services and advancing open science via these services. So when I start going into all the lovely details about how wonderful we are and how much we use Kubernetes, and I always like to remind people that's not the important piece. The important part is the use of these services and the broader fabric of services to advance science. So I like to put these in a couple mental buckets. Uh, we, we run, you know, and, some extent the infrastructure. We have servers, we keep the servers on, we keep the OS uh, updated and, and the bad guys out, that, that sort of thing. So in the end, even in the cloud, it's just some, uh, some computer somewhere. So we, we do have the infrastructure team that, that runs the Kubernetes clusters, that runs uh, the, the path servers or, or path facility that Brian will be talking about later. Uh, we have what I think of as the backbone services. So these are the things that almost everybody uses, no matter what angle you're coming from, whether you're a collaboration or an individual researcher. So these break down into a bunch of different categories. But today I'll mostly be talking about uh, the uh, Compute Federation, which includes Condor Pools and, and CEs and the OSDF. And then finally, splitting out from the backbone, we have uh, different whether it's researcher specific or researcher oriented services or collaboration services that, and or whether they're bespoke or trying to enable a certain particular science collaboration. I kind of think of these as our uh, wholesale uh, division and our consumer division. So, so the, we actually do tweak about what we do and how we operate depending on whether we're trying to enable a collaboration who turns around and maybe enables a thousand of their own scientists, or we're working directly with a, a PI in a particular group. As always, uh, there's a good number of faces represented on the team. I try to get you all on uh, the, the slide here, but thanks to all the people that actually make this happen. 
Um, and I'm, I'm really happy to report that I need to redo this slide next year because I'm really running out of room. So it's great to see the team growing and, and everybody contributing. So I'm going to talk a little bit about these different pieces. So, and first of all is the infrastructure status. And especially if you took an app since uh, 20 uh, or got distracted by global pandemics or whatever you're doing the last couple of years and hadn't been paying attention, we've worked enormously hard uh, to just short of tear down and redo how we approach our, our infrastructure. And of course, the fun part of that is we don't get the opportunity to turn things off for a month when we're doing it. So this is uh, the proverbial changing out the engines while the plane is flying. So we have really started to focus on infrastructure agility and uh, the tool that we've selected for this is Kubernetes. Uh, so we, uh, over the last couple of years, have become a, a really heavily uh, Kubernetes shop. And, and the reason because of this, or the reason behind this is we are able to move so much faster, whether it's uh, upgrading services, whether it's rolling back services, whether it's enabling developers to push out a service earlier. I don't ever want to hear you know, somebody say, well, it's great that you completed the, this new wonderful widget you built. Give us two months uh, so we can order hardware and, and then you can try running it. So uh, the focus in the last couple of years has really been the, the, uh, providing more agility to the infrastructure. And uh, the way we do this are through our, our various Kubernetes clusters, uh, both in Madison and at the University of Chicago. So, uh, just to give you some high level statistics of where our Kubernetes clusters are, where they're going, uh, last count, uh, we have about 200 different containers running all the different uh, OSGA backbone services and a good number of the collaborations ones. Uh, we cross uh, three clusters for the centralized ones. Uh, Brian will talk a little bit about how we also use Kubernetes for the path facility. Uh, a good marker is since we switched to keeping all of our configuration and Git for this for all these services, uh, we've developed uh, or deployed about 7,500 changes. So this ends up about 30 changes, I think, uh, per, per week if memory serves. And then uh, in terms of updating and rolling out new versions of services, we build about 100 different computer images a week and, and get those out into our system. So again, the idea is we want to really shorten between that time uh, between good ideas from the development team to deployment, and then depending on whether it was a good idea or a bad idea, roll back or roll out to users. A little bit on the backbone services. Uh, there is just a ton of these. Again, we have 200 different containers that compose all the, the things that production services team do. So I'm gonna skip a good number of them and focus on maybe the two big ones. One is the Open Science Compute Federation. Uh, so this includes all the different pieces that help us utilize computing resources. Some of these are really familiar, particularly to the users in the room, such as condor pools, right? The things that you actually uh, see jobs running on. Uh, but there's a lot of infrastructure underneath this as well. Uh, there are CEs that we run. So the CE is the compute entry point of how we interact from the outside with a batch system at a particular site. Uh, we run uh, Gliden factories, which is how we allocate resources and decide, make decisions about allocation for all the, all the different sites. So there's uh, one of the interesting things about the Compute Federation is of course, not everybody uses it and leverages it in the same way. There are some organizations that uh, use the CEs to get into the sites and then have their own stacks after that. There's some organizations that maybe use the CEs plus the Gliden factories. So we help them construct their own pools. And then of course, for us, the flagship pool for PATH is the, the OS pool. And for that, uh, we use all the different pieces of the federation. We also have the Open Science Data Federation. We've mentioned a couple of times and we've been, this I've been playing with uh, best ways to describe this. And the one I've settled on is uh, right now, this is a service that federates data sets across different uh, repositories into a coherent data space and delivers their object or objects to computational capacity through a network of caches. That is a mouthful of a sentence. So uh, particularly tomorrow, we're going to dig in a little bit deeper on the OSDF and this is 
more statistics and how it's operated and how it works. Uh, again, uh, this is uh, borrowing from uh, tips from Frank, uh, maps and a view of the different institutions that we touch uh, across, uh, I think it's really remarkable, across six different continents. Uh, wherever the ice cube folks are, we're, we're waiting. Where's our uh, Antarctica uh, OSG site? I think it can be done. The highlight, uh, as I said, the flagship for, uh, for us is the OS pool. Uh, so this was a condor pool operated uh, for all of open science, managed by uh, the, the OSG and operated by PATH. And this is a pl popular place to put uh, capacity as institutions, whether they have idle capacity or have capacity that they purchased, maybe that they promised to share with other folks, such as the, the CC Star awardees. Uh, I think, uh, so this is a little bit dated, a couple months old, but over one year time span, we're getting into the uh, tens of millions of jobs. One interesting thing, especially for the folks that have come to these for a while, is everybody's brain says, how do you fill one of these distributed pools with CEs? And that's only partially true these days. So it's been really remarkable, but as people keep coming with new uh, Kubernetes-based resources and other container-based resources, only about, given on, depending on the day, about uh, one half to two thirds of our capacity of the OS pool comes from uh, Glidens and the traditional CE infrastructure. So we actually are putting a lot of resources up through uh, that, or that, that are completely container based. So I, I marked uh, here with the star all the big institutions that are providing resources to, uh, through containers, which is uh, really a remarkable change over a couple past years. Uh, another aspect that is, I, I find, uh, again, maybe I'm just getting old, my beard's getting a little gray, uh, but a remarkable difference is how much our host and CEs uh, have grown. So instead of having sites uh, run their own service, uh, we tell them, listen, as long as you can get a SSH connection out, out to our farm uh, consistently, uh, we will host the OSG specific services as long as we can establish that SSH uh, connection. So at this point, uh, we have uh, 55 hosted CEs. Actually, I think as of this morning, we're up to 58, which is either close to or within striking distance of half of all the CEs that are within the OSG fabric service. So uh, again, as a community from a place where we, everybody, every site had to learn how to run this service and get it going, the fact that now half of these are run by uh, really two operators, I think is amazing uh, progress forward. Uh, this makes it simpler to run. Uh, and because it's now simpler, it means we can reach additional sites. And I think this is interesting because we now see a broader range of sites with a broader set of skills and a broader, you know, it's, it's not just, what do you say, you know, the big old supercomputing centers, which has some of its own uh, challenges uh, in terms of, some people have struggles with DNS. Some people uh, maybe switch from PBS to Slurm without remembering to tell us. You know, there's different levels of technical expertise here, and it's actually been really fun to see these progress. I'm running a little long here, so I'm going to skip over the OSDF. Uh, other than I, I want to again point out that this is a growing place within our production services, and uh, Compared to a couple of years ago, as we start, we're really starting to fill in the maps within uh, the US and making it so we can uh, scalably distribute data out. Um, a couple other highlights from the production services uh, the access points that we run, uh, we now run both at University of Chicago and at UW-Madison uh, using slightly different technologies from the two sites. Uh, the thing that's really important to me for access points is this figure that uh, Maron showed. So the access point is not part of the OS pool, even though we somehow dis sometimes describe this, but it's a central place where you can put your job. This is your home 
for DHTC. And then we like to think of you being able to connect to all sorts of different resources. So yeah, we get up and we talk a lot about the OS pool, but the access point can connect to the path facility. It connect to resources that you individually own at your campus. It can connect to access allocated resources, commercial clouds, so on and so forth. So uh, mentally, stop thinking of the access point as a submit host or a login host or something that you have as part of the larger cluster, but as a standalone service uh, that you know, the product, for us, the production team runs, that then has the opportunity to connect to all the different computing capacity you can. All right, looking forward, uh, again, in the first half, last couple of half, last couple of years, we really took a refresher to what the OSG fabric of services is. We really went from different infrastructure models. We brought in new service operational models. We try to make it a lot easier for institutions to contribute their resources. And we have quite a bit left to do. Uh, we have a lot of work to move the collaborations from more bespoke services and backbone services. Uh, we are really excited about some of the new upcoming uh, campuses that we're working with, uh, particularly some of those that won CC Star Storage Awards. Uh, that will be a new type of hosted service, uh, with maybe the same flavor, but now with storage uh, uh, as the hosted CEs. And uh, of course, uh, for the PATH facility, looking for more and more ways to have groups uh, connect and, and utilize the resources. So that's all I have for today. Any questions?